So a lot of people, just given the attention that taking a knee has has gotten, a lot of people think they have an opinion or they, they have an understanding of, of what it's like to be in the NFL and race relations and what it really means. And just, you know, from your experience, what do you know about race relations in sports, in, and in particular professional sports and football, that we don't know? Like, just... Any, like anything, just what comes up when you think about race relations? Uh, that you have an advantage within a defensive line room uh, with a coach just by being black. Um, you know, I, I've experienced multiple times, you know, uh, being the light-skinned dude of a, a, of a group of D linemen because the traits that you want to be a defensive lineman is to be big and very mobile and fast. And... Uh, and it's sometimes it's it's very reactionary comparatively defensive line to offensive line offensive line it seems to be you're thinking a little bit more it's a bit more uh it's a bit more left brain where it's like okay right step left step where defensive line you're just kind of moving through space and uh people who tend to do that better defensive line are have been black athletes and me being mixed race you know i think i've always had a fight in me to want to prove my athleticism because of being, you know, the white guy in the room, even though I'm not the white guy, right? But the thing is, is that I've seen other white guys in the room kind of, you know, have to face, you know, playful discrimination within a room because, like, oh, well, he ain't got the bend of, you know, uh, Demarcus over here. It's like, so he doesn't bend as well or he doesn't do these things. And now these, now I've seen some very athletic white dudes, right, including myself. But the thing is, is that, I think that's one thing that, that, that isn't seen within it. You know, when we talk a lot about, like, white privilege, I've seen a lot of black privilege, you know, within the context of sports and wh- where a lot of benefit of the doubt is given, you know, to picking a team. So it's like this guy had three sacks this preseason and this guy had three sacks this preseason. If we have to pay them the same amount, I'm probably going to pick this black dude because I've seen more black people in the form of what I see be more successful than that. And so, I mean, the thing is, it's like, I think those are the types of situations that we don't see. Um, But overall, I mean, I think when in the context of a team, race a lot of times goes out of the window and it's merit based. Right. And Mm -hmm. it's like if you're putting good shit on tape, meaning like we film in football, you film every single practice drill, every single practice, every single move, what time you get out to the practice field, what time you leave the practice field and then everything on the tape. Um. For, for game days. So if you're putting good shit on tape, if this white guy has 20 sacks and this black dude over here has 14 sacks, it's like, well, then it's a no-brainer, right? But if you come down to these, you know, um, uh, 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 decision points of, you know, everything is equal, I think you're going to take the form of something that you've seen more often than not be successful. But to get back to what, what you asked in terms of race within sports, I think it's one of the greatest things to, it's a great equalizer because it's so merit based. Yeah. Right. And that, Hey, look, if this dude's kicking this dude's ass, I don't care what color he is. And so it comes down to merit based. And then, you know, you got a a lot of those playful racial things that I think that's what doesn't translate to a larger society uh, or to a player that's in a locker room and then leaves it and then feels like, you know, they can make, you know, now they're working for like Enterprise Rent a Car, right? And they make a racial joke that they can make inside the locker room that was no problem, and now it's an issue, right? Because before it's like race did not matter because it was based off merit. And I think that's one thing that I actually miss about a locker room is mm-hmm. being able to speak so freely without the repercussions because it's, it's a matter of what you can do on the field. So in the Sports Illustrated article that you wrote, you called it football, the flag, and the right to speak our minds, okay? And now this goes back, you wrote these articles at the time when a lot of people were critiquing NFL players for taking a knee, for kneeling during the national anthem and saying, look, at this is really un-American and you should be thankful that you have a job and one thing after another. And I think President Trump weighed in in a pretty harsh way and lots of people were weighing in, right? A lot of people supporting but an equal number of people not supporting. And so you said, you know, when you invest your money in an athlete, whether you're watching him or her in person or wearing his or her number, he doesn't or she doesn't owe you their silence. Can you... Dude, that's, like, that's intense. So take some time to air that out a little bit. 
So we invest money in you. You don't owe us anything. Well, I think, you know, that was coming from a personal place when I wrote that where, you know, I, uh, I wanted to be able to do something different than what the context of the locker room was providing me. And that was to write an article that spoke to these large issues, these large social issues um, that, you know, when you're doing a post-football interview, it doesn't really facilitate. You know, it's like, well, what did you do on that third and two? What were you thinking? Well, I was doing this, I was doing that. Well, now about larger issues and societal issues. Let's talk to you about that. that those don't come up in the function of sport, right? That doesn't, that, those, those questions that they, they, they kind of just, you know, the, they're not entertained at all because it doesn't facilitate the, 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 um, the wins and loss column or the, um, what do you call that? The, the stat box. What's the stat box called? Box. Where you go. And so, um, so yeah, I think it was coming from a personal place where I felt that I wasn't developing my own voice. And I think that's what a lot of people, both athletes and the general public, get confused is platform with voice, right? Just because you've got a platform, just because you've got a, a, an Instagram or a social media, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have a developed voice, right? Most of us, especially in, in, a, in a period like this, and even as we get older, the thing is, is that it's hard to feel individuated and to recognize that that we're not just a recreation or a mirror of everything that we've experienced and heard other people say, right? Now, you don't want to think about that too often or you become nihilistic pretty quick that none of your thoughts are your own. But um, I think that's the way I felt and that I needed to individuate myself in that, in that moment. And I think, um, and I think what I, I, I felt angst because there was somebody making a movement to make an individuated statement. And because of that, I felt like I had to defend that because I couldn't do that on the national stage the same way and to feel individuated. So I wanted to, I wanted to support that. I wanted to support that, you know, somebody saying, wait, no, hold on. Like, I see something that I think everybody else sees and doesn't articulate. So then, you know, there, there's a motion that's made. There's a motion that's made uh, to bring that up as a conversation. Now, say what you will about that motion being made for three games and the media not covering it, but then the media started covering it all of a sudden, and all of a sudden it was a story that we all needed to interact with, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a whole other discussion there in terms of, you know, kneeling, and it doesn't mean anything to us if the media doesn't cover it, right? If it's not put in front of our faces, then it doesn't mean anything to us. Now all of us, yeah, what's that guy kneeling for? Nobody knows. But then when you put eight cameras on them, and then you attach a narrative to it, now all of a sudden it's all of our concern, right? So that's what I get concerned about media. And we talk about media, media, media. It's, well, look at the mechanisms of, me, of media instead of just blaming it on that and leaving it, leaving it as that. But anyway, so I digress. Yeah, he doesn't owe you your silence. And this brings up a thought in my head about intimate strangers. And um, I forget who, who introduced me to that term, but it was a sociologist that talked about intimate strangers and how we're, we're addicted to the, the, uh, to the depiction of pain on the, face, on the faces of our cultural icons. They represent the success and the pain that we wish to achieve. They're the demigods of a society absent of polytheism and crumbling belief systems. That's what I wrote over here. And, you know, when we're talking about anybody following the Antonio Bryant situation, right, that's going on in the NFL? Well, I mean, what is a player's off-season you know, off or off-field issues other than a drama for all of you to debate about what is good and what is bad about these cultural icons? You know, what behavior is good and what behavior is bad? And so, you know, I, I, there's, there's this, the term intimate strangers is that we... We have such access to people's lives on and off the field, you know, in class and out of class, right? And we feel compelled to give people that access, right? Well, I have to show people the Grand Canyon when I went. I have to, you know, show people this nice thing that I just bought or that somebody gave me. And so then there's a hyper critique of the, the hyper invasiveness that we all have through, through these social media outlets. And I think that, uh, when, when, when we talk about we don't owe you our silence, I think that was more of a personal decree of me wanting to feel individuated uh, and me wanting to articulate uh, me, not, me not wanting to be owned by uh, a collective ideal of, of, of fans, coaches, anything that dictates my identity.
Dude, yeah. Intense, man. And so the thing was, is that uh, I wrote that article and then I wrote one for Sporting News where I kind of changed my tune and I got a little bit more sharp. And, but that was right when I had stopped playing and Sporting News uh, wanted to, uh, to, to, to facilitate that and pub publish it. And then I wrote another one that Sports Illustrated and, uh, and Sporting News, I took, I took that, hey, I got another article. They're like, yeah, send it, send it. So I sent it, sent it to him, and it was critiquing Kaepernick. I started criticizing his movement and his, his, his joining of, of, of Nike because it didn't seem in line with what I was supporting before, and I, I brought it into question. And they didn't respond to my emails. All right? So Sports, Sports Illustrated and Sporting News didn't even respond because I, I was now critiquing something that would seemingly be a cash cow for them, which yeah. is the narrative of, of Kaepernick being this... Uh, uh, cultural sacrifice, almost. So, you so know. yeah, exactly, man. So it's like this, bro. Next, go, we'll go to the next slide. It's like it's this statement here, and then I, we'll take another question. But it's that statement, man. That's what you're talking about. The whole system. It's not just the teams. It's the media. It's it's one thing after another, man. Just the dudes in the suits. Don't speak on the issues unless they approve. But what you're saying is, once you sign a big contract, you felt like, hey, I can do this because it's guaranteed money. I can say whatever I want. Yeah, I, I write a, a thing called like a first round and seventh round perspective. So the NFL draft has seven rounds when you get drafted. So there's first round and seventh round. I was drafted at the end of the first round, right? So I talk about first round and seventh round perspective because I think the only reason I talk about that is because it's like, the ends of the distribution, right? Now, there's people that make less money than seventh rounders, which are called free agent signings. But I use that just to kind of show you the end ranges of the draft and that when you're a first rounder, you have more guaranteed money and a guaranteed contract. So that I think that helps facilitate guys to explore different parts of them more easy than the guys that don't have that, that solid contract, right? That they feel that they need to be at the facility 30 minutes early and that they need to be in meetings taking extra notes, right? So they don't get cut. And then the seventh rounders, um, they still do all that extra stuff, but they know that it could end at any moment. And because they know it could end at any moment, because they have less, a less fortified, you know, structure, then, then what they end up doing is exploring just as much, if not more, than the first rounder, because I had a teammate that was a seventh round draft pick or even a free agent, I forget. But in the off seasons, he made sure to drive Uber, right? So he would have a different cultural experience, right? Because this could end at any moment. And then he made sure that the Miami Herald wrote an article about him doing, uh, him being an Uber driver, right? To, to help facilitate who he is now, which is like wrestler, rapper, social media entertainer. Uh, and, uh, and I forget what else he does, but he does a bunch of different things now. And it's, it's the way he leveraged the NFL, you know, it helped facilitate that. But in terms of, you know, the men in sky boxes is, is, is again, it's a part of that structural functionalism where it's like, don't be this person that doesn't help the structure that you're a part of function, you know, and you feel that from a very, from a very young age where, you know, it's hidden within team morals and team principles that is necessary for teams, right? It's kind of this, 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 this implicit contradiction in being an athlete and being an individual, being on a team and being an individual, and, and that it's tough to be able to develop yourself as an individual separate from the team. And so, you know, because sometimes it's counterintuitive to what it means to be a team, which is a relinquishing of the self, which is a relinquishing of building any individuality. And so, it's kind of this contradiction that I felt my whole career, but I think that's also what helped me develop this perspective and say these words is that I feel like I never fully took on being a football player. I was just a dude that played football better than the rest of you fuckers. And so, and I think keeping that type of perspective is what has allowed me to do that. And it's the same thing I was talking about with playing the line of being black and white, where it's like, you know, I'm not black and right and I'm not, I'm not white, right? In their most negative, those are very negative ways to, to, to portray that. You know, but yep. I, I didn't go full gung-ho either way. 